him. Uh, and let me just give you a little background from my vantage point. In 2018, I interviewed every candidate, Democrat and Republican, running for governor in the state of Georgia. And almost to a person, everyone came in with this massive entourage, except this one guy just kind of came in with a guy, sat down, leaned back in the very cushy chair, and we had a great conversation, uh, no pretension whatsoever. Uh, and the actual other person who came without a big entourage at the time was the governor of Georgia, Stacey Abrams. Um, th these two then wound up going head to head in the general election. And if you believe Hillary Clinton, uh, my next guest didn't win, Stacey Abrams won. But of course, we know she went on to be the president of Earth in Star Trek. <laughs> What we got instead was a guy who came in under the shadow of the then president of the United States, and a lot of people in the suburbs in Georgia thought, well, he's that guy's guy, he's not my guy. And he then defined himself as his own person. And what have we gotten in the state? Some of the most robust economic growth, the first state out of lockdowns from COVID, school choice, massive construction projects outside of Metro Atlanta. And if you ever listen to me on radio, living in Macon, Georgia, an hour and a half south of here, driving between there and, and the beach, often on I-16, the most desolate stretch of interstate outside of Montana. And if there are members of the legislature here, the speed limit should be no speed limit on that road, but that's another point. Um, there are now, in rural Georgia, where there used to be nothing, there are massive construction projects because the governor of the state of Georgia decided instead of being the governor of Atlanta and north of I-20 that there was actually this whole expanse of a state south of I-20 that also deserved good jobs for people so that they also weren't crowding into Atlanta and further destroying traffic. And it's worked. If you drive from here to Savannah, Georgia, go through Macon, head on I-16, you will see one of the most massive construction projects in the country. It is a massive Hyundai factory that's being built for their hybrid and electric vehicles. Uh, there are massive projects happening like that all over the state, in rural parts of the state, in parts of the state that used to not get the attention of the government in Atlanta. Uh, and all of that is because we have a governor who has a heart for Georgia, not just for Atlanta. Uh, he also has a deep passion for Georgia the school with the football team, which is about my wife's only bone to pick with him because her dad went to Georgia Tech, but we can't all be basketball schools. Um, <laughs> so without further ado, my friend, the governor of the state of Georgia, Brian Kemp. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. So let me get the awkward question out of the way first. Um, this past Saturday, had a candidate for president come to Georgia, had some choice words for you, and then some of his supporters did a press conference and suggested you might need to be in jail. So <laughs> how's the campaign trail going? Uh, yeah, going, uh, going good. You know, I was kidding with a small audience the other day, and I said, you know, we had this big storm come through the state this week, and then now we're stealing with uh, Tropical Storm Debbie. So we, you know, it's our second, <laughs> second storm we've dealt with. But you know what? We weathered both of them. We're uh, doing great in the state. And I would just, uh, you know, look, a lot of noise out there, as you can imagine, uh, a lot of distractions, which, in my opinion, is not what we need to be doing right now on the presidential campaign or on any of the campaigns that we're running. Uh, in the state of Georgia to keep our majorities in the House and the, in the Senate. And so, you know, despite all of that noise, my position has not changed. You know, I've said a long time before, you know, the presidential primary ever started when we had all those great candidates that were running that I was going to support the nominee, that we were going to use our political operation to win Georgia despite past grievances, differences in a political opinion, you know, maybe ideals, issues, whatever the case may be with any individual or the former president, like it is in all of our best interest that we win in Georgia in 2024, unlike we did in 2020. And we have the path to do that, like my campaign did and the rest of the state ticket, whether it's Lieutenant Governor, Attorney General, Secretary of State, Agriculture Commissioner, School Superintendent, 
public service commission candidates, we all won in 2022. We all had libertarians on the ballot. Nobody went to a runoff in state races because we ran on our record. And that's what we need to be doing now. In my opinion, regardless of, you know, all the different things that have happened, we cannot afford four more years of the Biden-Harris agenda and now the Harris-Waltz agenda, which I think would be even more radical than the Biden-Harris agenda is. And so that's what we're doing. You know, people talk about our political operation, our ground game that we put in place to tackle and really offset what Stacey Abrams did in 2018 that we didn't really know much about, that we saw work in 2020, and we just decided, look, we cannot rely on other people for our ground game in Georgia. So we raised an extra $50 million in the reelection campaign. We paid to do the door knocking. We paid to do the modeling. We paid to do the tracking. We paid to do the phone calls. We put our own people on the ground with a lot of great volunteers in the state and had a better operation than the Democrats did in 2022. So we learned what the playbook was. And we've got to do the same thing uh, in 2024. So people that are talking about, you know, the ground game and turning it over or working for the party, we're already doing that. We were doing that a month ago. I mean, we're knocking doors right now. We've already modeled people in our state house districts and we're working on making sure that we turn base turnout out for people that traditionally vote early in our state, whether it's by mail or in-person early voting that, you know, will be here before you know it. And so that's what we're doing to support Republicans up and down the ticket in Georgia. And then also, uh, you know, I was with Senator Graham uh, and Senator Daines and Senator Ernst uh, with our great candidate in Montana, Tim Sheehy, um, a couple, well, I guess it was two nights ago. Uh, and we've done events for Sam Brown in Utah, Dave McCormick in Pennsylvania, Larry Hogan in Maryland, Pete Ricketts in Nebraska, trying to help get back control of, of the U.S. Senate. You know, I had a great visit at the convention with Speaker Johnson, so we're committed to doing our part. Uh, either nationally or in the state, the whole modern majorities. I don't think that's going to be an issue with our Republican incumbents in Georgia. But, you know, my point is we all need to be working hard to keep Georgia moving in the right direction. If we can do in 2024 what we did in 2020, it will end the narrative that Georgia is a purple state. Uh, it's a tough state here now. It's a lot different than it was when I first got into politics when Sonny Perdue won the governor's race and we took control of the state Senate. Uh, but it's still a state we can win if we have, you know, all the mechanics um, and, and things that you need to do in an election. We raise enough money, and then we have good candidates. And so, you know, regardless of all the noise, we're plowing ahead. So you sure are hanging out with a lot of people running for the U.S. Senate. Um, <laughs> which, any, any thoughts on your future? Well, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe, uh, you know, we get big enough majorities in the U.S. Senate that I don't have a lot of pressure to have to do that uh, in the future. I just figured so I'd ask. Yeah, well, I'm, I, you know, I have a lot of people uh, ask me about that. But look, I am, I've told people that is a distraction. You know, y'all, that is a distraction. I know there's going to be a lot of great people uh, here at the conference. Um, there's a lot of great people out there that can do a lot of really good things in 2026 and perhaps 2028, but we need to keep our eye on the prize for 2024. I've said that for a long time. We all need to be laser focused. We can worry about who's running for what, you know, for, for the governor's office or any other constitutional office in Georgia in 26, taking our U.S. Senate seat back, which we absolutely need to do to have a conservative from Georgia in the United States Senate. Uh, it's it's not supposed to be the way it is right now, and I'm committed to doing that. And, you know, however that ends up working out, uh, we'll see. But right now we need to stay focused for the next, whatever it is, 89 days on winning, winning the state, uh, winning the U.S. Senate back, holding the House, and getting uh, Donald Trump back in the White House. So you... you I can ask you this question like a lot of people because you, you served your first term, there was a Republican in the White House, second term now there's a Democrat in the White House. What is the collaborative difference between having someone of your party in the White House versus someone who's not? 
Well, the thing that really bothers me about the Biden-Harris administration is for the biggest thing, well, there's two really things that stick out to me. Number one, they're picking winners and losers in Washington, D.C. If you look at the IRA, I mean, we wrote a letter to our two U.S. senators before they voted on our IRA and said, look, this bill as written is going to pick winners and losers. It's going to help, you know, the big three automakers, the union-backed companies, and, you know, really pick winners and losers for the funding that was going to be out there post IRA. You look back to when you had the Trump administration during COVID and they were passing COVID relief bills, everything was done per capita. So, you know, Georgia would get the same amount per person in a disaster relief bill that California would. You know, and the, and the relief bills that passed under the Biden-Harris administration, if you had reopened during COVID and your unemployment rate was low, you would get less money per capita than a state like California that hadn't done that, that had higher unemployment rates. So they, they were rewarding people for staying closed longer versus just treating everybody across the country that was fair. So those, you know, those inequities for, for, the, you know, for the administration that's supposed to be for equity and inclusion, they were not. Um, but the other thing is, and I think we talked about this, I guess it was last year when I broke my pencil out and yeah. we were talking and I had the, you know, if you don't win, you don't get the pencil, you don't get to write the rules and regulations. And, you know, in this case, if we win the White House back and get conservatives back in office and charge all these executive branch agencies and, you know, commissions, whether it's the SEC, the FCC, F, you know, Federal Trade Commission and other things, you get the pencil back. So you can start erasing the dumb rules that they've written. I mean, they are legislating um, by rulemaking in Washington, D.C. Right, right now. And our, thankfully, conservative majority on the Supreme Court with the Chevron, Chevron case uh, undid a lot of that. But it's going to take years to undo uh, really them pencil whipping us. So those are two things to me that really stand out. Regardless of, you know, I just was reading on the way over here, I know, uh, the Harris campaign has a new ad about how tough on the border she is. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> and how she's going to, you know, hire more border, border patrol agents and how, you know, she's going to support this tough border bill. And my thing is like, hey, just remember, you're in office right now. You could do that right now uh, without being elected president if you could talk Biden into doing it. And I would remind people, Republican governors have been complaining about the problem at the border for years. We have done press conferences. We've asked for meetings. We've put out policy agendas or uh, 10 or 12 things that we could do to secure the border. And we know they will work because they were done, you know, by the previous administration. And you had the governors supporting uh, the Trump administration by sending National Guard troops. And you didn't have the chaos that you saw early in the Biden administration. It finally got so bad they had to do something about it because they were getting killed uh, politically on that issue. And, you know, I remind people the Democrats had complete control of all three branches uh, in the legislative process, the House, the Senate, and the White House from 2020 to 2022 when we were all complaining about the border. The Republican governors were, and they did nothing. And that's what people need to remember when they go to the ballot box in November. Let me ask you about some state policy. Um, you know, I, I'm actually in, in treatment as a recovering lawyer. Um, I've got a, another couple of steps to go in the recovery process. I've noticed over the last number of years up I-75, we're getting more and more trial lawyer billboards from lawyers in Florida who, as they've enacted tort reform, seem to be infesting the state of Georgia. Um, it, what's your view on tort reform and what the legislature here might be able to do? Well, we need it, uh, no doubt about that. As a small business owner, both Marty and I, which we have the greatest first lady in the country, Marty Kemp's here with us yes. today. Uh, but, you know, bo both of us have been small business owners for over 30 years now, and, you know, I hear from small business people. I'm hearing from our Fortune 500 companies, Fortune 100, just rank and file people that are out there. Uh, we need to do tort reform. We had a lot of success last session working with the House and the Senate and got a couple of bills passed. We had a couple other things that, you know, we got something done but probably didn't get it done in the way we needed to. And then we passed a bill 
that was really part of our legislative package that's allowing us to work with our insurance commissioner who I think General John King's in the audience. Yep. Uh, Over there. Um, great American, first uh, Latino elected statewide official constitutional officer in our state and uh, a great- Thank you for not saying Latinx. Yeah, a great, <laughs> a great, uh, <laughs> Just retired from the National Guard, helped build a border wall, COVID response all over the country, just a great American. But we're working, uh, our bill allowed us to work with, with John and his team and the insurance companies to get the data that we need so we can really figure out like what the rifle shots that we need to do legislatively to stabilize costs or even bring costs down and help right the ship. I mean, we want the system to be fair for everybody, uh, but right now it's, it's really, moving more toward the trial lawyer side um, and it's, it's killing people on the cost side and hurting our business environment. And I've told my trial lawyer friends that, a lot of them realize that. Uh, but that being said, it's gonna be a, a tough fight. But we're, I announced at the Georgia Chamber event two days ago uh, that we're gonna be holding some round tables around the state, bringing in some of the people that have been adversely affected by the environment that we have, lost coverage and other things, and really start making the case to the public and the legislators as to why we need to do uh, more than we've done now. Uh, but make no mistake, it will be a tough fight. So if anybody out there is uh, willing to be helpful in that fight, I would just make sure you're talking to your legislators, telling them real world stories about what's happening out there. I mean, I had a, a company that dropped some insurance coverage on some office warehouse space that we have. Thankfully, that's a good market and there's other carriers that we could go to. But, you know, some industries are losing, you know, losing their carrier and they have nowhere to go. And uh, this has been an issue in Florida, uh, in Texas and other states around the country. And so we need to do something legislatively and, and we're looking forward to working with the General Assembly to do that. So other policy issue, a We've now, I think this past year, become one of eight states to expand school choice. Uh, and I appreciate your leadership in actually publicly supporting after a number of years in the state trying to get Republicans on board, and yet here we now at least have put our foot in the water. Well, look, I am so uh, proud and thankful of the General Assembly for what they did on school choice. You know, the education secretary came down the other day and was criticizing what we did. And I'm like, I do not understand how you can criticize taking kids that are in failing schools and giving them an option to where they can get out of that failing school and get an education that they deserve in our state. I mean, to me, that is an absolute uh, no brainer. So we're in the process of implementing all of that right now. Uh, I'm very thankful to all the advocates that are out there that are going to help on the public awareness campaign to let people know what options are out there. We need to make sure that we implement this well uh, and have great success with that. And so uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. And, you know, hopefully the, the education secretary and the federal government can figure out how to fix the FAFSA form that they continue to delay uh, to help people get um, financing for college educations, which has created a mess all over the country. So we were going to have this guy here, real, real tall guy. I think you, you've probably met him, but he had this hurricane come through his state and he had to cancel. And he actually wanted to come down and brag about how Virginia is like the greatest economic engine in the country. So I was kind of glad he wasn't here because it clearly is a lie because I live in Georgia and know how much better you are than Glenn Young. And you may be shorter, but you actually generate a lot of economic power in the state. Well, you know, some people, when they lie, their nose gets long. I think Glenn gets taller. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Gonna tell him you uh, said that. No, yeah. well, he, he's not actually lying though. They did yeah. uh, win CNBC's number one state for business, and I texted him and congratulated him uh, on that. We were in the top five again, which is great. Uh, you know, CNBC, some of their criteria, um, we don't like being number one in some of their criteria. Yeah. If you uh, actually look yeah, at it. it. For those of you who don't know, like uh, access to abortion and things like that have now become business Yeah, criteria. social issues weighing into the business equation, which to me, you know, it should be investments, jobs, you know, your business environment, but they've kind of expanded that, but whatever. 
Um, we're happy with our stand, and we're still, for 10 years in a row, the best state in the country for business when you have the people that are actually making the site selection decisions. Uh, the consultants that are working with the companies, they still continue to, or have at least for the last 10 years, ranked Georgia number one. But, you know, y'all, that's what's so great about the South. Governor Yunkin, uh, Governor Ivey, Governor McMaster, Governor Lee, uh, such competition, Governor Abbott. We are always competing uh, with other states in the South, and we've done incredibly well. We've had three record years in a row. The good thing, I think, for somebody like myself that ran on strengthening rural Georgia, uh, I think over half the jobs we've created, which I think is up to like 170,000 now in the last five and a half years, or the private sector companies have created that they're bringing to Georgia, uh, you know, ha over half of them are happening in, in areas of our state outside the 12 metro county regions. So literally dotting the whole map in Georgia, giving economic opportunity no matter somebody's zip code. Over 70% of the investment dollars, uh, which is, you know, billions now, is going outside of the 12 metro regions. And these are just projects the state has worked. This is not talking about just the organic growth that's happening in Atlanta or Columbus or Macon or Savannah uh, every day. So I will, I will take what we've done the last three years and put that up against anybody in the country. And we probably talked about this last year, but for the first time a year and a half ago, GDP, GDP growth combined in the South, when you count really Texas all the way over to South Carolina, uh, outpaced the Northeast for the first time ever in the history of the country. And it's because of the Republican governors. It's because of the business environment, and it's because, you know, the environment in the Northeast and in places like California, I mean, they are literally just running people uh, out of their states. And we're glad to take them as long as they vote our way. Yeah. I have not been up to North Georgia and, and seen that on, on 75 up towards Dalton, the, the project up there, but I've driven past that Hyundai plant yeah, outside absolutely. of Savannah. That is a massive facility. Um, it, one of the things that, that I, I guess I, I should ask, because a friend of mine's involved with that project, and like you've now got local governments. For those of you who don't understand, th this thing is like a mile and a half long construction project in a rural part of the state where now you've got this local towns that may not have the local infrastructure to handle all the people who are going to be coming in, which is yeah. a good and well, bad thing. Growth is definitely a challenge down there, which, you know, we're, we're working uh, with them on that. I mean, this facility is incredible, y'all. And this is the thing about IRA, the Hyundai plant, Rivian, the SK battery plant, all announced before IRA ever passed. So, you know, the Biden-Harris administration, Marty got so mad a while back because they were running an ad like taking credit for all those jobs coming. The SK battery plant up in Commerce, Georgia, if you ever seen it when you've driven up 85 North, Governor Deal announced that <laughs> in the transition. I was with him, and then we announced the expansion in 2019. Joe Biden was not even in office when that happened. So, like, for them to take credit for this. He doesn't know. Yeah, no, he, he forgot. <laughs> but... Um, so, you know, these, these things were coming anyway, and so, like, the way they incentivized and then pick winners and losers, it's just bad public policy. Uh, but regardless of that, the Hyundai plant, we have gotten, I think, 12 or 14 suppliers for that plant, too, in places like Dublin, Statesboro, Metter, Effingham County. Uh, so you're going to see really a transformation in these communities. Uh, but we're also putting hundreds of millions of dollars into infrastructure on roads. We put uh, $1.5, $1.6 billion additional dollars into our freight and logistics plan last year with the support of the General Assembly. I'm very thankful to them uh, for that. It's going to help us address transportation needs in that quarter. Probably $600 million of that will be uh, ended up designated to the freight plan in that corridor. We put another $250 million into a low interest uh, revolving loan fund over at GFA that uh, many of you remember that Hunter Hill, who ran for governor as a state senator, is, is working for uh, the state now, and I appointed him to the GFA director, and he's working on these lo low interest loans that local communities can get to build out their water and sewer infrastructure, and then we're also doing a lot of that through uh, the incentive packages for the companies. And so 
and then we, we have spent over $50 million, too, with grants that will go to local communities uh, to help with workforce housing because it's our belief and the General Assembly's belief that, you know, if you're living, uh, you, you should be able to afford to live where you're working in our communities across the state. So, like, even though we have challenges, we have a lot of solutions that we've been working with the locals on. So I'm really excited about the future, and it's going to be transformational. I mean, people now that are graduating with a, say, engineering degree from Georgia Southern University, they're not having to move to Atlanta if they don't want to. You know, they can stay home. They can move to Savannah. You know, they can stay where they grew up. That is the values of our state, and it's what makes Georgia the best state to live, work, and raise your family. Before we wind down, I should ask you, we did have Debbie roll through. What, how much storm damage did we as a state sustained from that? Yeah, a lot. We're actually uh, headed to the airport right after this, and we're going to fly to the Savannah airport, get on helicopters uh, with uh, Lieutenant Governor and Speaker, uh, Agriculture Commissioner Tyler Harper, and a lot of the legislators will be on the ground. We're going to fly and see a lot of the flood damage. It was mainly a water event after the first evening when the storm uh, came up from Florida, kind of came through the Valdosta area. Was a good bit of power out at one time, uh, around 50 or 60,000, I think it was. They got that back on relatively quick after the first wave of the storm went through. After that, the winds kind of died down where they were a lot more tolerable, but the rain kept circling back around. And we got lucky. There was uh, two tracks. One track was going to take the storm out off the coast of Savannah, regain strength, and it was going to, you know, boomerang back around and hit Savannah again a day or two later. The second model had it going on up the, the coastline, which it did, and it really pounded uh, South Carolina and North Carolina with rain. But we had um, places like Statesboro, Scriven County, and others that had over a foot of rainfall in a very short amount of time, which created dams busting, which created homes below those dams uh, getting washed away, being underwater. And so there's significant damage to... Uh, we had roads washed out. Uh, we're still inspecting bridges. So even though, and it was so, it's so, what's so crazy about these storms, like people in Atlanta or in Athens, we didn't get a drop of rain. You wouldn't even hardly known we even had a storm come through. But for people that were down there, you know, big flooding event was just a mess. Uh, we have, uh, I was texting with Congressman Austin Scott, uh, him and Commissioner Harper, and our team are already working on um, the ag situation with blown over cotton, peanuts floating up out of the field, uh, some damage to our you know pecan tree, pecan trees, and other things. And so, we're just now getting to where we can get out there and start assessing all of that. But we're going to go give a briefing today when we get on the ground, get a briefing. But uh, I am so proud of our response. We did an early state of emergency, which allowed us to. Uh, put resources close, closer to the storm. We deployed the National Guard, so we were able to respond very quickly, helping clear roads where we could get power crews in, uh, making sure we had high water rescues. We probably did 40 uh, swift water rescues, people that you know may have had roads flooded out. They couldn't get from their home that had lost power and they were running out of water and food to, to the mainland, and so we were floating people in boats. Wow. National Guard had high water vehicles, but just a great response from a lot of hardworking Georgians and, and a lot of other people that were helping us down there. So last question before you get out of here. Football season. Go dogs. Coming up. You feeling good? Yeah, I'm feeling good. You know, we got our, our I read this morning our center is injured, which creates a, a little bit of issue since we lost Cedric Van Pran to the NFL, who's a great guy. And, a great football player, but they're just being very cautious. So, you know, this season is such a tough schedule. We got uh, Clemson in Atlanta on, you know, so-called neutral field, even though it's in the state of Georgia. It's going to be a really tough game. We got Alabama there. We got Ole Miss there. We got Texas there. And then we also, as usual, you know, have Florida, Auburn. And so we have, you know, really six teams that, potentially have a shot at making the playoffs at the end of the year. So it's going to be a grueling schedule. We've got to get lucky and stay healthy. Uh, but we have the players to beat anybody. And, you know, I think there's such a fine line. If you look back at the SEC championship game when we lost to Alabama, we didn't play our greatest game. They played their best. And we just had some people hurt and not 100%. 
and that really hurt us in that game. So we gotta we gotta keep people healthy, and we're gonna have to have a lot of young players step up and get after it. But it's gonna be an incredible year. Of course, it's gonna be one of those years. If you're a traveling Georgia football fan, you're gonna be broke at the end of the season. <laughs> Well, you know, having never actually been to Athens for a game, I, I may hit oh, you up for. Oh, you need for, to come. Yeah, let us I, know. I, I, apparently, I need that life experience, so I'll do that. Governor Kemp, as always, thank you for yeah, taking thank time. Thank you. Hang Appreciate y'all having me. Thank you for being great. No, great. Good, Good luck the rest of the way. I know thank it's going to be a long day. Thank you. So my next guest. I actually wanted to ask him some questions about something that, well, a judge has told him he's not allowed to talk about. So I'll, I'll avoid. So, you know, there's, there's this, 